Hello, good morning if you're on the West Coast. Good afternoon if you're in the middle of the country or on the East Coast. I'm Douglas Clayton. I'm a director, playwright, and producer, as well as a past artistic director and currently senior vice president at Arts Consulting Group. But most importantly, I'm an alum of Directors Lab West from the class of 2007 and a producer for this year's series, Directors Lab West Connects. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today. Very excited for this conversation. I'd also like to thank our ASL interpreter, Danny Casey, who you can see there on the screen with me. Um, and know that this is being recorded and will be archived on directorslabwest.com and on HowlRound TV with uh, appended captioning as well for anyone who watches this after it's posted tomorrow. For our low sighted colleagues, I am a 40 ish white male identifying individual with brown hair, a short brown beard, wearing rectangular glasses, and an open collared blue shirt. I'm seated in my office presently with a comfortable couch behind me and two paintings over it by the Polish bisexual art deco painter Tamara de Limpica. And uh, our interpreter, Danny Casey, is a young, light skinned woman with short, tussled dark hair, wearing a black shirt and in front of a blue curtain. So Directors Lab West, for any of you who are not familiar, uh, is a 20-year-old all-volunteer-run organization that every May provides an eight-day intensive full of workshops, panels, masterclasses, and more for emerging and mid-career theater directors, choreographers, movement directors, intimacy directors, have been crafted for and by theater directors and choreographers, live streamed by our partners at HowlRound to their website and to our Directors Lab West Facebook page. So if you're having any trouble seeing it on either platform, try a global art and technology community. Hello, Scarlett. Hi, um, I am a youngish white woman with short brown hair and um, glasses that are brown and rose gold. I am sitting in my room in Brooklyn, a green plant on the other side, which I don't know the name of, and a poster that says block party, 7 p.m. Excellent, excellent. So the three of us will be in conversation for the next 30 to 45 minutes uh, discussing reimagining liveness and connection for virtual space. Um, as I said before, please feel free to submit questions in the chat. And at the end, we will try to bring those forward um, and fit them into the conversation. Scarlett. So let's get started. Uh, Maddie and Scarlett and I have had several conversations already. And one of the things we wanted to start with was the fact that right now our entire community Basically, what do we do <laughs> right now? And then what should we plan to be doing in the future? Um, and for a lot of us, very we've been trained and we've become very confident and very comfortable in a certain way of creating our art and sharing that with people. Um, but uh, we were thinking that perhaps a good way to get into the question of what's going to happen in the future is to start by looking at the history of change and innovation in the past for people who've been really invested in that and sort of bringing the past, present, and future together that way. So I'd love to start by just inviting you, Maddie and Scarlett, to talk about the broader trajectory of La Mama and Culture Hub from the past leading up to today and how that frames the way you're thinking about the future now. Great. Um, so Culture Hub is a global art and technology community that was founded in 2009 by La Mama Experimental Theater Club in New York City and the Seoul Institute of the Arts in Korea. Um, these two institutions um, were founded around the same time in the early 1960s and perhaps late 1950s for Seoul Arts. Um, and they were both founded out of necessity. Um, La Mama was, was born out of a need. Um, Ellen Stewart had some broken hearted friends, uh, broken hearted playwrights living on the Lower East Side who needed a place to do their work when Broadway just wasn't quite it. Um, and so she rented out a basement space on East 9th Street and she said, you guys do, do plays at night. I'll turn it into a boutique during the day because she was a fashion designer. Um, the boutique never quite happened. Um, she was a very successful fashion designer on Sex with Avenue, but um, you know, she, she made a life supporting others and um, and creating a, a, a vast space for people to experiment. Seoul Institute of the Arts um, was founded by Chi Jin Yu um, because there was a, an emerging style of performance and, um, and he was a playwright and he wanted actors and performers who had a different sort of training who could offer his <laughs> work um, more interdisciplinary approaches that could really meet the contemporary needs. 
Um, and Ellen Stewart and um, President Yu were both, um, had a, a deep, deep, deep relationship. Um, they, they brought shows to each other's countries. Um, they had residencies. There was a, a rich history of cultural exchange. Um, and and that, that was the same for them and many other institutions and relationships um, with artists and organizations around the globe. And um, in 2009, they got together and said, hey, um, what can we do with the internet, with emerging technologies to deepen these uh, collaborations, these, these cultural exchanges? Um, and and how, can, how can we do it with a healthy level of skepticism? Um, not to say that, that this can replace uh, all of these plane rides that we have to take, but it can augment it. How can we open a window when I'm in a studio on Great Jones Street in New York and have that window go to Seoul, Korea? Um, so that's what Culture Hub was founded to do. It was to explore emerging technologies. Um, now we've grown into, um, we're not just focused on La Mama and Soul Arts. There are collaborations and partnerships around the globe. Um, and, and this is what we're exploring, international exchange and creativity. Um, there are many other facets of what we do, but um, it's a little more relevant today, asking the question, <laughs> how do we work distributed? Right. Uh, so you, you got to uh, a sort of important key for our whole conversation today, um, which is that this isn't a conversation about how we replace um, what we already know. This isn't a conversation about, you know, re replacing the world that existed. And it's certainly not a conversation about how do we replace the experience of live theater um, that drew so many of us to this art form and have made us really committed to this um, either. And, and we want to acknowledge, all three of us want to acknowledge that there's a lot of emotion going on in our community, in our international community right now. We've heard a lot of that over the last five days at the lab. Um, there are people who are really energized by the experimentation and the change that's going on, but there are also people who are frightened. And there's also a lot of us who are mourning um, right now and are, are really feeling that loss in a really impactful way. And for some of us, we're in a place where we can take that forward right now into explorations of new ideas, but for other people, they just need to process the morning right now. And that's okay. Um, and that's great. And that's the nature of our humanity in our art. Um, but that said, um, a lot of what Maddie and Scarlett have been doing is exploring what new things we can do that are additive and that are complementary to the we're all together live experiences um, that we've been doing. And, and in a way that is explorative and looking to the future and that isn't just trying to solve our problem right now either. Right, so I'd love for you to you both to talk about um, that that relationship, the relationship between live, connected, in person, human, but then also what that means when we're talking about form or at distance or the use of technology that that facilitates that. Yeah, like you said, Doug, you know it's it's been really important for me to nurture an expansive framework um, as opposed to a reductive one. So thinking of virtual engagements, virtual art, uh, remote connection. Um, distributed um, engagements, all of these things, not as an attempt to simulate or replace or replicate the physical real world, but as, um, as more of like an alternate strategy full of potential energy. So yeah, it's been a really interesting um, journey. Like Maddie mentioned, Culture Hub has a history of um, uh, engaging in collaborations and intercultural exchange through remote forms. So now you know, it's a moment for us to kind of uh, respond and celebrate to the unique parameters that virtual context is proposing and um, kind of letting that teach us how it opens up all these new ways of thinking about liveness and connection. And I think that kind of, um, I don't know, the, the duality is important because one day I wonder if I'm fetishizing the OG liveness and I truly have so much faith in the committed presence and intimate exchange in shared physical experiences and um, the next day I'm so enamored with all these mind blowing ways and metaphors and all these different spaces that come up and rethinking liveness through technological means. So for me, it's been important to chase curiosity and um, accept a contradiction. And, um, you know, like I would say I'm very much in mourning of the shared live experience and in tandem, you know, I appreciate the current moment um, that's allowing us to reflect on our ideas and biases about liveness and presence. And everything else. So, yeah, something that has been sort of grounding for me and for the for the 
people that I'm, I'm working with on a daily basis at La Mama and at Culture Hub is that um, this is our life. This is part of our lives now. Um, and, and I almost think it is a disservice to say, well, is this theater? Because if this is our life and if this is really part of our lives in a, in a way that is, weddings are happening here, funerals are happening here, you're, you're, people are meeting their first grandchild here, um, that, that it, we can just remove that distance and say, okay, this is life, this is theater. Um, if, 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 if theater is, is our lives. Um, yeah. and, and I also, you know, I feel like theater is essential, theater and art at large are, are essential to having a culture, a shared culture. Um, and, and, you know, we're in this mindset that of, of, of being on a linear journey towards reopening and towards um, finally, after, after many steps, getting to a place where we can have education and we can have art making again. Um, and I think that we need to take every step, of course, towards public safety and health, and that is the most important thing. Um, but that in order, the, the reason that we, the, that we work so hard to have public health and safety is so that we can participate in a shared culture. Um, that this, this, this work that we do together is the reason that we have cities, it's the reason that we have roads. Um, and, and yeah, that it doesn't really get to just be pushed off to the side and said, hold on to. As an artist, you can have that relationship to your own practice. Um, but as a culture, um, we're all here. This is our life. This is happening. Yeah, I, it's it's so funny because the, when I first moved to um, this country, one of the best advices that someone gave me was like, don't wait for the thing to happen. Like, don't wait for someone to give you the opportunity to do the thing because you're already doing it. So bring like focus on the awareness of the fact that you're already doing it and that's the story and then like one of the first things I learned about was in high school being an artist was fluxus and I was so mind blown that life and art can have such a intimate and interchangeable and fluid relationship so I've been thinking about um that time a lot and you know how I that really informed how I positioned my art making in relation to my life living practice and right now it feels like there's this more of like a um, sense that theater is something that can be embedded or embeddable in everyday life rather than theater being outside of life that you like opt out of life to opt into. So that's been, I don't know, that's been kind of a part of my optimistic kind of perspective of, oh, you can actually engage in your own terms or you can author the terms of your engagement in a way. And it's not something that, um, you know, going to the theater, even as a theater person can be a daunting experience because of the formality and all of these other things associated with it. So it's been interesting kind of, yeah, renegotiating, like reauthoring my relationship to life and theater and life and art and how that can kind of coexist in tandem in a much more fluid and um, kind of uh, embedded relationship. Yeah, and and it also speaks to accessibility, um, like through the programming that we're doing at La Mama and at Culture Hub, um, there, we've had viewers in like the majority of US states, um, which at, at any given shows, I think we would have some non-local to New York City folks in the audience, but um, not, not at the same scale. And a lot of that is actually thanks to HowlRound and it's saying, we're in this together. Um, we, I, I keep on thinking, the, uh, something that I've, I've been thinking is that we're in this sort of collective hackathon moment where we're all sort of, all of a sudden, we all have the same variables and the same problems to solve. And if you're, if you wanna be a part of it, yeah, go for it. Like your, your exact way that you're gonna approach this problem is different than everybody else. And, and so, so we have this like collective visioning going on of, of so many people just, you know, putting something up on the board and, and saying, ha, I, I got that, what, what about you? And then, and people are going in so many different directions, which um, we weren't having before this moment. Um, there was, it was much more niche if you were working in this, in this uh, sort of blended zone of, of live web and live performance, um, even though it is, it is such an integral part of our lives 
you know, through, through phones and talking to family members and friends who don't live near us. Um, those, yeah. Yeah, it's the, the, the whole thing of, you know, what arguably the most famous theater quote ever about, you know, theater holding the mirror up to nature from Hamlet, like we forget sometimes that we're supposed to be engaging people about their lives and that that's, that's what this is. And we can get so into our own box that we're in. And now, as you say, it's, it's broken open in different ways and we need to be responding to what people, the way people are living their lives, which is such, such a great point there. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the access thing is really interesting, both in terms of, of what, what this kind of experimentation or, or progress or exploration means to who we can connect to, but also to, we've had a lot of conversation the last few days about the, that our industry has been controlled by gatekeepers and, and sort of who, who controls the buildings, controls the arts, and that that's changing maybe. Um, so love to hear more about that. Yeah, um, yeah, the collective hackathon. Uh, Maddie uh, spoke this phrase last week and we're like, that's perfect because <laughs> we're actually as part of ReFest, our annual um, festival bringing together artists, technologists and activists, we're hosting a hackathon this Saturday. So you guys can actually be a part of a actual um, hackathon experience. But yeah, that really resonated with us because you know, a way of thinking about our current moment is a time where you can become your own sorcerer to your own theater magic, um, magic of theater. And I, you know, like the product driven production model can feel fatiguing and also just like a regurgitation of tried and true methods and other ways can feel, other ways of working can feel untenable due to like very real issues, like what Doug mentioned about um, being vetted, like who gets to go into certain spaces and, you know, all of these very real issues. So yeah, during this time, you know, it feels like the definition of art, like what the where the work is located has expanded from the end game to encompass the whole process of figuring out together. So the, you know, like the medium feels like the message more in like an acute way to me and like the act of working together to configure our orientation to the virtual interaction is the work, like is the story. And I find this empowering because, you know, I have so much faith in this decentralized, democratized, grassroots way of working together. You know, I, I really believe that it can yield new strategies and short circuiting biases and hegemonic structures. Um, so much of like the conventional spectatorship model prioritizes kind of one directional um, transmission of message and also all of these things about formality and class. And um, yeah, it's, and I also think, you know, another key word for today is intimacy and for me, intimacy comes from this process-oriented approach as well, rather than intimacy as a content. You know, intimacy in the act of working together so much more depends on the personhood in a way and the presence. And I like that because we're all kind of babies learning together that our perspectives in a way can't be like so polished or sophisticated. So we're just kind of trying to communicate what we see, which I think often think is um, one of the most important things. Uh, and there's like no bullshit to fall back on in a way. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the reasons that I've enjoyed working in this zone of like art and technology is because I don't come from a tech background and I don't have this like, I don't know, I feel like it, you have to be like into tech in order to engage with tech or you have to be a techie or something, um, which also, ha you know, theater has some of those same well, are you a theater kid or a theater person? You know, like there are these these barriers and boundaries. Um, but I feel like working in, in this in these sorts of ways, you know, before COVID, um, it really required me to connect to, like Scarlett said, my curiosity. And, and I just had to ask questions and I had to just meet things where I was and where it was. And from that distance, whatever it was, what can I see and 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 what do I understand about it? Because if I if I you know if I can barely see a thing, okay, what is that outline? Um, or if I can hear, you know, you know, there there's a different there's a different way of engaging with something if if you're not trying to do the same thing that you've done before, which is also an experimental approach to working. Um, and, and we all have to be a little bit more experimental, which is really exciting because a lot, you know, a, a lot of people think that that's, that is the work of the fringes is to be on the, on the experimental pulse. Um, but, you know, to me, experimentation is really just about 
a process, a, a procedure, a set of variables, some of which are controlled and some of which are uncontrolled. And what happens when we go through this process and invite an audience in? Um, so yeah, it's just, it's connected me a lot, a lot, a lot closer to my curiosities um, and to the gut and, and to just say, okay, what do I want right now? I want a, I want a joyful experience. I want laughter. I want to work with people who I love or that composite is really interesting to me. I want to go towards in that direction. Um, and, I, and I want more people to be able to do, to have license to just go towards their curiosities um, and, and to not be, you know, we can't be so worried about selling tickets or, or making sure that you're, you know, you, you get the right listing in the right, right magazine to get the right people in the, in the seats. Like we'd have to re restructure our, our relationship to all of those things. Yeah. There's one of the things, of course, for the lab that we were very clear on is that, you know, there's lot, lots of people out there in the world talking about how institutions can survive. And what's really interesting to us in this context is how we do the work. What is, what is it we're doing? And, you know, we could do a whole five day, collective discussion about what theater is, which, you know, we don't need to try to try to define today. Um, but, but getting away from that and saying, like, what are what are we in it for? What are the what are the deep components that are underneath? You know, it's not just the molecules, it's the atoms, it's not just the atoms, it's the quarks or whatever. So, um, and you know, you, you brought up intimacy before, certainly the title of the session is about liveness, too. Um, so I'd, I'd love for you to we, we say live theater all the time. And there's a whole set of assumptions built into that word live. So I'd love to know how you two are thinking about what liveness means and can mean, and not just in that one paradigm of the proscenium theater or whatever, but in how it relates to the, the artist experience and the audience experience and the, the collective connection. So how do you define live or, or intimate <laughs> right now? Yeah, I mean, go ahead. Scarlett was saying a lot about like the 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 process is the is the real intimate thing that's happening here, which I really appreciate. Um, and I, I I just did a project last night with um, a few good friends uh, in Texas at the Vortex Theater. Obviously, it was you know done on the internet, um, but I was talking to some folks afterwards. Um, and one of my friends who, who played a character in the, in the play, in the playlet, as I, as we called it, cause it's not quite a play, but not quite an episode either, um, was that, you know, she was, first of all, you know, it was emotional because we care about each other and we cared about working together and God, it kind of felt so, so good and, and rich and also bad, but really full to to work together and to care about something um which is which is which is something um and then she was just talking about that she was committing what her work of this process was committing to how to speak to another person during this time that that was her actor's work and learning <laughs> to really believe it and learning to really believe how to connect with a person digitally and then reflecting on on how much or how little how able she was to say yes to that um and that she realized that she was clinging to the idea of someone physically being with you in order to really feel them um which i think is so interesting because um especially in the the ann ann bogart talking about theater as a space to eulogize the dead. Um, and yeah, that, that this space is, has to bring up things that don't exist and, and people that are not with us. Um, and, and is that an act of liveness to conjure, not necessarily in some mystical way, just, but, or maybe, but maybe just with imagination, um, maybe that's liveness. Maybe it's not the necessarily the spit that you get from the actor because you're in the same room, um, but that it is a different, a different, uh, yeah, act of imagination. Yeah, and I think also I was just 
like reading about liveness and it's like oh the definition of liveness really changed a lot throughout history like when mm -hmm. tvs came into suburban homes like that totally changed what liveness is and our relationship to um media and like what we think of as lives so i think it's also important to remember that um you know it's we sometimes it's yeah. like i noticed this in myself that i start thinking of it as an immutable concept but it's actually historically always been in flux and also live you know when doug first posed that question i was like okay live so the opposite is dead or you know what is what is it in relation to like and also like another very I don't know, co controversial world, a word is real, like real versus virtual, mm -hmm. meaning virtual is fake or like, and you know, like in Maddie's beautiful um, anecdote, it's like all real because it's all, um, you know, it's all, we're having real experiences in virtual and real and live and dead context. So I guess for me, like, again, going back to the expansive framework, um, it's been um, generative to think about everything as real and, um, you know, kind of um, tease things out that way. But one, one of the kind of threads of the questions that we were getting previously, like one, one kind of area of questions was, um, what about the audience's experience of presence and their own experience of presence and their experience of being together? Like how, like how does that work? So I think there's something there in how we can think about liveness, um, you know, and uh, in our ReFest uh, gallery, so we our um, annual festival bringing together artists, technologists and activists, um, it's virtual this year um, and it's online and you can visit it at our culture Hub website and there's a lot of really interesting examples of this kind of participatory strategies or um, uh, ways in which folks can contribute uh, their presence and actions and gestures in a way that um, has impact so that's that's been like an interesting way for me to think about liveness um, an audience member enacting a gesture that ends up being the thing like not being inconsequential but actually affecting the thing and change the changing the thing and becoming the essence of the thing so the story first and foremost becomes the actual like call and response and the exchange um like some of the artists are working with like games and the idea of play and in that case the entire narrative is dependent on the participant's subjectivity and them showing up and the artist showing up and participating and collaborating together so yeah, I would, I think something about co-authorship, multi-directional exchanges, um, uh, where your action matters to each other, I think that to me is a key uh, way into liveness. And another one is um, thinking about liveness in terms of the unknown and the slippage and the errors and technical, technical difficulties and glitch and latency. And I find those all really generative sites for thinking about our relationship to life art and life and Doug you mentioned that um, when you ask people what their most memorable moment in the theater about half the people say that it was a moment where something got messed up and I find it liberating to interface with technology almost as like a mythical creature like a mystery like weather that I'm collaborating with as opposed to trying to understand and analyze because you know I a lot of the times I'm more most interested in um, intentional misuse of technology or adapted use of technology that strays away from its intended use which is also bound with all of these hegemonic ideas of like best practice right so it creates this unnerving space um, which you know maybe I can call liveness where we can mm -hmm. examine um, what we assume to be true yeah and I think like we all, especially like in this Zoom call, um, we have that little heat of the moment before we go live. And there are all these little, you know, the HowlRound producer and the other lab producer and, and the people doing all, all the little orchestrations that are gonna make this come through at, at, at exactly two o'clock or 11 o'clock. Um, and, and that's a, you know, that's a, that's a heated thing. And it's something I'm also experiencing on Downtown Variety. Um, there's the liveness of the collaboration between the artist and the technologist or the technologist as the artist or the artist as the technologist because we're all blurring that way. Um, and then there's that, that heat of the moment of the audience of, am I in the right place? Am I seeing the right thing? Okay, what, what exactly is this thing uh, that I'm hearing or, or, or what? Um, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, if anyone missed, so apparently our feed cut out for a minute while Scarlett was talking. So if anyone missed 
what she was saying, she was saying that sometimes the glitches and when things go wrong actually are a great uh, thing to explore <laughs> and a really exciting part of the experience. So um, she was literally speaking to reality as it happens. So there you go. Um, I'm really, Amazing. really interested as we talk about the, the liveness and the, the audience and the, the artists and all the different pieces, that, that interactivity part that you were starting to talk about there, both of you, um, I think is something that we're all experiencing because the, the, the step one of us all learning how to do Zoom theater or any other kind of, of theater online basically was, well, well, you have to put a big wall up against the audience, mm. right? And we've seen so many things where the artists may be collaborating live and the audiences in a chat box like we have now or in some other way are experiencing something live and able to interact together. But what we have in a live theater experience where you know, the moment where the actor changes their performance because they can feel the energy from the audience is something that's, um, uh, that I think a lot of us are missing right now. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about that and where you're seeing people experimenting with that and, and what that adds or, or is lost on that front? I mean, there are, I, I, we're working with some artists, particularly Noom Collective, who will be on Downtown Variety on June 5th, um, is they're, they're working with different sorts of data streams that can flow between computers, um, like a microphone or a video feed that can um, not pick up like, okay, here I see 30 different people's faces or I hear 30 different people's voices, um, but there's like a, a different level of data or a metadata that can get transmitted between to have a live interaction. Um, so that if I make a sound as an audience, like, oh, <laughs> like that, that could um, it, get, get, in, get routed to the performer and will affect the performer. I don't, I can't speak on it so, so elegantly because it, we don't know exactly what they're gonna do yet. Um, so there's that level, there's this, the, sa the same way that you can like put a heart on the Facebook um, data driven. Um, one, one way that, you know, I've been ex exploring is just through imagination is um, putting one person in the audience when I'm sitting on my bed and, and, and imagining how they would react. And it's, it's almost a little bit more of a, of an acting exercise than to, to hear the person laugh and then say like, okay, that, that, that landed, um, which is kind of wacky um, and doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, I think it speaks to, okay, how do we talk to people now? How do we feel people now? Um, and I think you do just have to be a little more open to what that means. And you, you have to go beyond this idea that it's people in a room together. Um, okay, so what if it's not? Is it, is, what if it's plural? What if it's people in rooms together? Then, then what, when, what do we open with that? You were saying yeah, something I mentioned to us. a little, oh, go ahead. I was, I was gonna mention, I, I was talking a little bit about games and um, yeah. play and that as a really um, generative framework to think about interactivity because it's the story is dependent on the action of the participant. And it's a kind of, the game starts to serve as a site where site of encounter and um, all of the myriad directions of potential energy being um, kind of determined into, uh, into embedded, like executing in time, in real time, based on the input of the artist and the participants. So that's been a really um, interesting way to think about interactivity. and. Yeah, this year's ReFest was curated with two kind of um, core curatorial um, missions. And one was participatory strategies and one was intergenerational collaboration. So both were very high risk activities. Um, and, you know, it, it was kind of an interesting, um, very specific inquiry um, that we had of like, okay, clearly we're, we're going to have to reimagine this festival in a virtual space, but how do we take those um, uh, kind of, whether it's sensory experiences and something that has to do with touch or like, you know, smell or like holding each other, things like this, and also like um, intergenerational community conversations and how do we translate those things online? So it's been, yeah, and I, I found that, um, you know, I've been having a range of experiences as a curator and as a director, like whether it's going from working with someone who doesn't own a computer even, or like doesn't engage with the computer at all in their practice. and doing a very technical how-to to going into like, let's, you know, improvise and jam out in a 3D virtual avatar form and 
do all of these things. So all of that feels like the same labor and the same thing in a way. And if there's like no like tech part and the theory part. Um, and that feels like, I don't know. And that also relates back to the intimacy question for me and the access. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's very, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question of interactivity because there's also so much content in the world right now. And um, it's so, it's at the tip of our fingertips to like go and summon a media content to come into your living room. So what does it mean to sculpt experiences that are um, calling for a more proactive engagement on the audience's part? Mm -hmm. um, and is that something, you know, like what does that mean when you're, are you trying to guess like what people will do? And this, these are some of the same questions I ask in like immersive theater when I make, when I make, you know, participatory environments, the exact same questions actually. And it's like, are we trying to guess what people are gonna do or like create a fertile and rich enough environment that it can take, uh, you know, like infinite amount of impulses. So yeah, I have found that, you know, instead of trying to translate what worked in a physical space, trying to really try to not know and try to respond to the parameters of the virtual world has been helpful. Um, because I also work as a translator um, between Korean and English. I've been thinking about that metaphor a lot of like, what does it mean to translate? Because it's never a purely technical job. It's, it's technical and it's also poetic and it's also artistic and personal and all of these things. So yeah, using that as a metaphor of like, you can't fully like in a sanitary institutionalized way, take A that worked, thing A that worked or was a certain thing, a certain DNA in real life and then translate it into a virtual space and for it to be a literal like um, carbon copy of it. It's always gonna be a different thing, a different creature with its own DNA. So how do we actually embrace that? And um, yeah, I feel like I strayed away from your question about interactivity. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> no, 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 this, this is great. And I really love the, the resonance there that you just, put, you just uh, highlighted about the fact that some of the things we're pursuing and questions we're asking in a quote unquote high tech more environment are the same things that a lot of us have been exploring in the even more low tech than a traditional theater environment in an immersive theater environment or site specific environment um, where it's trying to get away, you know, it, trying to be more interactive, more live than the experiences sitting in a 500 seat theater watching people behind a fourth wall. So that, that a lot of these questions are still the same questions. Um, it's not new questions, really. It's applied in a different context. That's really, um, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Um, and also, you know, interesting back to the, the additive point that we moved before and going back to access, which you were just talking about, that there's certain kinds of access to our physical spaces that we have. Obviously, technology is allowing access to different kinds of audiences in different places and in different manners um, that can work better for others. But technology doesn't work for everyone either. To your point, some people have access to virtual reality Oculus sets and can have a whole experience that way. And other people have phones or computers. And other people don't have any of that. And so this, this is all different ways to explore you know, the, the core things that we're after. So um, I would like to, <clears throat> speaking as our time already is flying past, um, speaking to stage directors, um, or I should just say directors, maybe not stage directors, directors, choreographers specifically, there is a physical element to what a lot of our experience is, um, obviously for choreo choreographers in particular, movement directors. Um, so what's your, your experience or what are your thoughts about people engaging physically with work that has a lot of technology or virtual elements to it? And we were talking the other day that, you know, Zoom theater where we're all sitting in a chair with our head in a box is different. And even how, you know, seeing somebody in downtown Variety last week who just moved back and like we're in a Zoom shot, but they were from here and standing up was it was almost thrilling because there was suddenly a physical component that we're mm -hmm. losing. Yeah. So we'd love your thoughts on just the, the, the visceral physicality <laughs> and how that can live in these kinds of things. I mean, I, I, I think um, there's a set of expectations that come with working in Zoom or in a platform that was built for corporate meetings. Um, and there are all sorts of different things that are just going to come up, um, like, and this isn't necessarily the physical, but say, um, Scarlett is, is doing movement and, uh, we want that full screen and I am speaking 
a, a poem or a monologue in that moment, but we don't want it to switch to my feed or, or I'm playing flute and, and we want that to underscore what, what Scarlett's doing. Um, there are so many ways that we can't do that. We can't it, like in, in the Zoom sort of setting. Um, and, and it's because this, these things weren't built for performance. Um, so I do wanna just also say that uh, something that Culture Hub has been building for about five years now is Live Lab, which is um, uh, an open source experimental interface for web-based collaboration. Um, and it's a very flexible tool. We're, we're releasing it beta to the public on Ju June 5th. Beta meaning we're close. We're not all the way there, but we need you to experiment and come work with us to get us there. Um, and- Hackathon, collective hackathon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and the idea is, is that um, we want pure media feeds of, of cameras and of audio that, that can hold many, many, many different ways forward for artists so that there is, we're not confined to a flattened plane of, of 2D boxes um, there and, and that it's interoperable with other softwares that allow for more, more potentials. Um, so, so even just being in that mindset um, of not trying to figure out how to get around a Zoom or a, a, like a video conferencing technology, but to, to say, look, this, is, this was needed beforehand because we can't, some people can't cross borders, some people can't um, leave their homes, some people can't travel freely. Um, and so we've needed these tools and we will continue to need these tools um, for art making purposes. And, you know, the, the, the simplest things um, like creating your own frame around the box and playing with that or, or yeah, like you said, putting, I, I keep on wanting to like put the, the computer in, in, in the microwave or something. <laughs> um, just doing things that are unexpected and that are curious to you mm -hmm. and, um, you know, or having the shots start like like that and then coming up um, or, or anything really. Like there, there are so many different ways to, to subvert what we expect. Like that was probably really unexpected. You didn't expect to see my legs and we're like, we saw the legs, that's <laughs> not right. We're only supposed to see from here up. Um, yeah, so. I mean, everything Everything is physical. I mean, that's like kind of, yeah. I mean, everything is real, everything is physical, even as we appear to be these talking heads, you know. I was just, I'm rehearsing this play um, uh, with Padua Playwrights written by Guy Zimmerman and a lot of, he said some, the playwright said something to me that blew my mind of like, why are we so tired all the time when we're doing Zoom rehearsals? And it's like, oh, maybe because our brain is having to furnish the rest of the uh, perceptive reality. Like, it's like, we're just like kind of, this is like a frame of like a camera. It's like a viewfinder that we have like a one-to-one -one relationship to. And because we're having to do imaginative labor to like actually populate the rest of this like reality, maybe that's why we feel fatigued. So that, you know, it's like, it's a physical experience. And um, I also feel like, I don't know, my, I always feel like my life is, like I tend to gravitate towards creating collages and non-linear narratives because that feels like that reflects my life experiences more truthfully as like an immigrant woman of color. Like I, my story doesn't, you know, and I like, I was Blanche in Streetcar Named Desire in high school when I realized this of like, oh, this is a really interesting story, but like, how can I also like craft stories that feel like a more direct reflection of my like, entropic life that where things don't make sense and things don't add up to a cohesive summary. So I feel like working with technology, you know, like not knowing, messing up, you know, glitching out, all of these things are in a way more sincere. So it doesn't feel um, reductive in that sense. It feels like um, more naturalistic almost. It's like whatever that means, like more of a sincere reflection of my contradictory existence and my uncohesive self. And I always say, you know, for me, theater is really an act of rehearsing life. And um, even like the act of managing feeds, like in that play I just mentioned, we're doing a lot of stuff where we have like three cameras on an actor so that we see the actor um, from like three different angles and like the actor 
might be seemingly doing one thing to one camera, but like to another camera, it might look totally, he might be texting under the table or something nefarious might right. be going on that you can't see on one feed. So all of the, all of the contradictions, all of the possibilities of um, multiplicity of self, of contradictions, uh, collage narratives, this feels very actually like much more naturalistic to, to my life and to how I, my uh, relationship to life. So yeah, that's my response to the physicality thing. Like it's all physical. So, you know, like how can we um, embrace that and like think about the rectangle zoom feed more critically? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, and thank you so much for the, the live lab uh, beta that's going up in a couple of weeks. I know there's definitely people who have been really assertive on the exploration of, of using the tools that are out there and having tools that are more conceived with connection to the um, uh, to performance or to flexibility or to creativity as a- Yeah, created by artists mm -hmm. for artists. Yeah. And yeah. it's not gonna be a magic solve, fix everything, but it's a, it's a different path forward, um, which is exciting to have some choices because a lot of things have been limiting choices. Right, right. Um, so uh, just kicking over to, to some of the questions that have been coming in. There's a lot of questions I wanna say that are, uh, are sort of technical. There's some how-to questions. There's the how do I get involved with Culture Hub questions. Um, there's questions about what, you know, what, what tools are out there that they should be looking at, what really innovative, innovative things are happening they should see. So we talked a little bit about that, that we might pull together some sort of curated links or something and share afterwards. You two are up for that? Yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Great. Um, yeah, so and we also will we'll probably pull on our folks at Culture Hub who wear different hats than us because it's not one person or one, yeah, genius mm -hmm. bar. It's uh, <laughs> over here. We we have this because we have we work together. Great, excellent. Um, so let me let me. I've got like two two questions just to toss out here as we're coming to to the end of our time from the chat. Um, what is just just as you are working with technologists and artists together, right, in the ReFest, but in, in a lot of the work, where, where does the impulse come from first? Because there's some folks who have expressed some concern about saying, I have this technology, now I need to find a reason to use it, right? As opposed to, I have this artistic impulse, how do I best facilitate that? Or I have a human impulse, what's the best way through? And since you've got people who come from different angles, what's your, what's your sense of, What's the cart? What's the horse? What's the chicken? What's the egg? If that makes any sense. That's a really interesting question and something that we intentionally engage. We intentionally engage those questions when we select our resident artists. Um, and our, you know, we're currently in the process of um, selecting our next generation. And yeah, that's very much a question. Like, is are we um, looking at an artist coming from like um, maybe they're a playwright coming coming into like experiment with VR? And what that what that is, and um, maybe maybe someone's like a UI UX designer looking to come in to work with a playwright. So it's kind of like um, we very much want to nurture the diversity of where people come from and like how they want to engage other realms. Whether it's something very defined, like I want to work with VR and use that to stage my play, or whether it's something more more open. And also like a part of what we do is play matchmaker and like yeah. kind of facilitate those relationships so that um, folks that who might have not shared space before um, because of all of these isolated disciplines and spaces like, you know, we see culture as a site where people can come together and kind of not know together. Um, the, so the tagline for ReFest that we use is um, bringing artists, activists, and technologists together to explore our role in reshaping the future. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, it's a collaborative act. Theater making is a collaborative act. Um, and, you know, we've also with our experiments in digital storytelling program, we've highly believed that the the influence is going to go. It's a it's a dynamic state. Um, it's a back and a forth. It's not. Um, and and if there is this technology, when a writer gets wind of it and starts to write for that technology, it's going to pull the technology in a different direction, and vice versa. When a when a when a technologist um, when a writer has an idea, the technologist will say, "Well, what if you can actually shut off the light in that room? What if that happens?" And and so you know we're gonna 
we just need to have more sites of intersection and collaboration so that a you don't feel like you have to be everything in order to work in this space and, and to have a voice in this space and to play um but uh yeah to know that that we need to come at it together um and it's not a commercial for like tech industry come <laughs> come support our work you know it's it's a look we're artists are really good at imagining things tech activists are really good at imagining you know a, a, a world in which emancipation for all exists okay how do we get there um and technologists are are really good at, at saying okay here's here's one here's one way okay that's going to steer us a little this way and and then the imagination says no we need we need we need this um so yeah it's a yeah and for me like uh specifically as a director i think like the director's practice is a really um amazing resource and i there's a lot of potential energy right now like i find like i said i find myself playing chameleon a lot and a metaphor that i've been thinking about a lot is slime mold because slime mold is like these um organic material that it's it's like internet for trees like they they kind of communicate with each other through um by being infinitely adaptable and infinitely like non-self in a way, but in doing so it's able to transmit information and like bridge collaborations in a way that's like, so it's like so rhizomatic and so um, uh, kind of uh, collective intelligence. So I feel like, yeah, I, I've been thinking so much about how I appreciate my background and training as a director because I'm able to kind of um, plug myself into different places uh, and uh, kind of uh, different places where there's rifts or spaces or glitches, slippage, so that I can play um, chameleon, be the slime mold, and um, uh, look at the kind of dramaturgy from a very kind of multifaceted angle. Mm -hmm. That's great. We, we always try to capture key tidbits and takeaways from each of these sessions. And um, I want to be the slime mold is definitely one of those. I'm, <laughs> I'm the theater as the slime mold of society. I love it. So, <laughs> We are, we are almost to the end, and there are certainly other questions uh, that people submitted, which, like I said, we'll provide to you afterwards so we can share back your thoughts on them. Um, but there is a question that we asked to all of our guests here during Directors Lab West Connect, so I'd like to ask each of you. Um, and uh, this is the question, and whichever one of you can go first as you prefer. But please briefly, just in you know, a few sentences, share something you have learned or discovered or started thinking about during this quarantine period since COVID kicked in in March that you plan to incorporate into your practice as an artist going forward? Do you wanna go first? <laughs> you, you go. I can go first. Um, I think for me, uh, building an intentional relationship to technology driven by awareness and curiosity has actually allowed me to build intentional relationships with everything else. So, you know, I've been obsessed with propagating plants as you can see behind me is my um, little jungle that I've created in my house. But yeah, it, it really heightened my attention towards completely non-technological systems like nature and plants. And also a big part of my practice is very much based on the act of making with my hands. And, you know, so I've been actually able to connect with that part of my practice more. And I think there's such a um, pressure in a way to like, oh, we have to become all very tech savvy and like, you know, like really do something with technology because this is our time. But in a strange way, like I, I'm trying to be, uh, have the discipline to be generous with myself so that like, you know, it's not like the only thing, you know, the, the, the definitely the very intense relation, heightened relationship to technology is there, but how can we let that also bring our attention to what is not that? Right. Okay, I, I have, two, but I promise it'll be, <laughs> it won't be crazy. The one is um, a more sustainable relationship to living and working and uh, potential dismantling of the 40 hour work week, um, requiring 40 hours in a physical space if, if that's part of your life or the sort of like hustle, 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 um, but, but um, a different relationship to with the sort of propagation of online spirituality and learning and art making um, a different relationship to being there um, excites me so that we you can 
be somewhere else and have that not disrupt and dismantle your career, um, which artists have been doing for a long time now, uh, saying I live in the mountains and then I also live in the city. But I, I think people deserve that of all stripes. Um, and I like being in a space where there are no greats who have come before me and there are no rules that have yet been set. I feel free here and uh, yeah, much more playful than, than I have been even in unconventional theater performance contexts. Um, and I feel a little bit more drawn to what do I love? What, what makes me laugh? What, what makes my heart beat? Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much to both of you, to Maddie and to Scarlett. And thank you to our fabulous ASL interpreter, Danny Casey. Thank you. Um, as we've come, come to the end here, we'd like to also uh, acknowledge our longstanding partners for the Director's Lab, the Stage Director and Choreographer Society, Pasadena Playhouse, and Boston Court Pasadena. Um, we're excited to be back physically in those spaces next year, but uh, certainly hope to engage with all of our alums and our, our new community in a different way uh, in the future as well. So again, all those questions you've submitted have been captured and will be shared. And this recording uh, will be archived and available on directorslabwest.com and howlround.tv um, very soon with closed captioning. We hope that you will all tune in again tomorrow uh, at 11 o'clock Pacific for a conversation between Luis Alfaro and Lori Willery who will be sharing reflections on remote teaching and community engagement in this time, uh, which is yet another angle into this world that we're exploring together. So thank you all so much for being with us today. We hope this conversation sparks more. Feel free to continue a conversation on the Director's Lab West Facebook page. And otherwise, we hope to see you all tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.